Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's Andrew Collins, um, and obviously the title of the lecture this afternoon is Finding Eden. Now, um, I'm going to take you to southeast Turkey, um, and a place called Gebekli Tepe. I'll explain why it's called that later. And um, this gentleman on the right here, um, with the, uh, the Bedouin headdress, um, has been tilling the land um, all of his life, and... During the, from the 1960s onwards through until um, the early 1990s, um, he kept finding pieces of carved stone in the fields. Um, and they would gradually move these to the edge of the, uh, the field. And they realised that they might have some kind of archaeological importance. So um, he went to Urfa Museum. That's the, um, the, the city of Urfa, which is ancient Edessa, which is about 15... Uh, miles away from here and he told the archaeologists in there and they were not interested in any way but luckily um, in 1994 a German archaeologist by the name of Klaus Schmidt who you can see here um, of the University of Heidelberg and um, uh, eventually the German Archaeological Institute now they're the people that um, have been working um, at Gebekli Tepe he got there in 1994 surveyed the place um, and realised that there was something incredible here uh, because he realised that these carved pieces of stone, some of them were as much as 12,000 years old. Um, and one quote, uh, which I love, um, within, from him, within the first minute I knew that if I didn't walk away immediately, I would be here for the rest of my life. And that's indeed what seems to be happening because they started to uncover the hillside and started to reveal all these incredible T-shaped pillars, um, which were carved, as you can see, and they started to put in it all together, um, and they realised that they were uncovering the oldest stone temples in the world. Um, here is a reconstruction of what three of them look like, uh, but obviously you can see that they are um, you know, put in in circles for the others, and I'll come on to how many and how far this, this extends shortly. But, I mean, what we're talking about here are a series of what we would call stone circles, but the slight difference with those from the megalithic world is that these stone circles, the stones are radiating out like spokes of a wheel from a centre position. They're more complicated, all of the pillars themselves are actually carved and ornated in, in, a, in a manner which I'll, I'll show you now. Now, just from the point of a reality check on where all this is occurring, it's here. There's the Mediterranean on the left. Um, there's Turkey there, Syria, Iraq, Iran, in Armenia. Um, and it's basically when all of these uh, countries come together, as I say, in southeast Turkey, somewhere which is very in special to human evolution, as you'll see. There's some important statements here. Firstly, we're talking about a period of 12,000 years ago for the construction of Gubekli Tepe. This was a hunter-gathering society that would have existed in this area. People who were not known for coming together and constructing monuments in any way, shape or form. Um, and what these people were creating was some kind of religious stone complex for purposes which hopefully will become apparent. But let's point out that ideally there was nothing like this existing in the world previous to this time, nothing at all. Um, and yet suddenly this comes out of nowhere. And the actual organisation involved with this would have been immense um, because of the hundreds and hundreds of T-shaped pillars that they've uncovered so far, most of them are probably about 10 to 20 tonnes apiece, but the largest ones are between 40 to 60 tonnes in estimation. Now, these would have had to have been uh, designed, carved and removed from, from quarries which were up to a couple of kilometres away from this position and brought to this site um, and that would have involved uh, some kind of social structure um, that is beyond our current understanding of hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and it's pretty obvious that somebody was behind all of this. 
But you can see here, right in the centre, this huge, great monolith, carved monolith. It's got a, a, a fox on the side of it. Um, and originally, this would have been anything up to, uh, as I say, between 40 and 60 tonnes a piece at, at its full size. And the larger ones in the centre are believed to have supported roofs because these were almost certainly subsurface. In other words, they were roofed over and partly created, sunk into the side of the hillside itself. Here, this gives you an impression of the extent of it. And this goes on for some distance and it covers an entire hillside. Um, and according to Klaus Schmidt, and I'll be quoting from him a lot, it involved an elite class of religious leaders or shamans creating a hierarchical system and even the earliest slavery of dozens of people to fashion and move each stone over an extremely long period of time. And the other important thing here is that at the end of Gebekli Tepe, the site was not just abandoned or destroyed, it was deliberately covered up. And it's for this reason that the stones are so well preserved because somebody came along and they just covered up. Why exactly they would have done that is a matter of debate. But that took place around 8,000 BC. So it was up and running for as much as 4,000 years. It's a hell of a long time. And let's put some context into this. Gebekli Tepe is 7,000 7, yeah, 7, years older than Stonehenge. And Gebekli Tepe is almost certainly its ancestor. The earliest stone circles, and I know what Michael Tellinger has, has talked about, and we have differences of opinion on dates, but other than what he's talking about, the oldest accepted stone circle is unquestionably that which is going on at Gebekli Tepe. So that's 7,000 years older than that. 4,000 years older than Karahunj, um, stone circle complex in Armenia, which is in the neighbouring county, sorry, country, which is dated to around 5,700 BC and has recently been established uh, to be aligned to the constellation of Cygnus and thus the Milky Way. Um, and you can see the difference in the style from Gobekli Tepe, the carved um, pillars, to obviously the erection of, of these um, un, uh, carved, unhewn stones here. But that's something we've come on to. 7,500 years older than the, the pyramids of Egypt. Now, people that say that the Egyptians didn't have enough time to learn the skills and technology of, of stoneworking or the rest of it, just think of the fact that Gebekli Tepe was 7,500 years earlier than this. And 5,000 years older than the Sumerian and Akkadian civilizations of the Fertile Crescent that really established themselves around 5000 BC. So that's the sort of time frame that we're talking here. Now, these stones are incredibly beautifully carved. Um, as you can see just from this example, the way that the, the fronts, the sides, the tops of them carry a variety of different animals. In this case, we can see what appear to be herons, uh, there are arachnids there. I'll show you this stone closer a little later on. There are serpents crawling all the way around the side of this stone. There's an incredible depth of, 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 um, of depiction of all the different animals. You know, here you can see various other animals. There is vultures here. Um, again, something like herons. Um, uh, this is probably something like... Well, I don't know, it could be a fox, could be a, um, a gazelle or something like that. Here's a, a boar stroke pig. Um, and the actual types of animals are essentially this. Bovines, foxes, gazelles, aurochs, um, lizards, canines, pigs, arachnids, insects, reptiles, snakes, lions, flightless birds, waterfowl, vultures, and a few human images as well. So, you know, for anybody saying, right, let's try and put this into some context through symbolism, you're going to have a hell of a job because there is just so much here. Plus, there are 3D carvings as well. You can see this, this creature here, which could be anything from a, from a lizard to a dog uh, to a feline, is actually carved on the side in full relief on the side of one of the stones. Now, how much effort and work would have gone into creating that? 
There are beautifully stone-carved vultures. Look at this. This wouldn't be out of place in, in a modern um, art museum today. How incredible is that? Um, that's another vulture. Vultures a lot. In fact, of all of the uh, animals or creatures of the world, vultures and snakes seem to be the most prolific. As I said earlier, these are subsurface buildings um, for some kind of religious activity built into the hillside. Oh, and just as evidence of that, you can see this, this cut, um, sort of rectangular thing here with these lips going out there. I reckon that these are parts of skylights um, or windows that would have been on the roof of these buildings, obviously extremely heavy, um, and that you would actually have entered inside the buildings, probably from above, possibly that there may have been a side entrance as well, um, and that obviously when the roofs caved in, these things fell to the ground, which is where they are. But, I mean, just look at, at the engineering involved with that, and that's almost 12,000 years old. Um, now, this is an image known as the, the Gebekli Goddess. You'll find a, a lot of images of this on the internet. Uh, I won't go into the full details of, of what I think uh, is involved here, but look at the head. It's actually shaped like a mushroom, uh, and there is a lot of mushroom imagery at this site and other similar sites, uh, which we could go into, but we won't. But Gobekli Tepe means the hill, Gebek, uh, which is Tepe, of the navel. Um, the Gebekli in Turkish means a swelling as in a belly or navel, um, which in Greek, the word was omphalos, which was the term that was used for, like, the centre of the world. Um, and it makes you wonder whether Gebekli Tepe had some sacredness which was carried across the millennia. And what's so interesting is that, that there is a single tree on the top of the hill, um, which is a mulberry tree, which is a form of sycamore, the same uh, variety as, as, like, the fig. Um, and this was considered, and probably still is, um, sacred to the local people, and they would actually put their own burials. These are, these are quite modern Muslim burials um, in, in, in and around this tree. Now, why exactly they saw this as sacred is something I'll ask the next time I go back, but this is something I've only just found out. Right, there are felines, um, lions, uh, at Gebekli Tepe, as you can see here. This, this one here, like rampant and another one, Kushan, on, on the side of one of the stones. And this is an intriguing thing, because one Turkish archaeologist, um, talking about Gebekli Tepe, um, looked at a sculpture of an animal and half-human, um, half-lion, and said, it's a sphinx, thousands of years before Egypt. Southeastern Turkey, northern Syria, this region saw the wedding night of our civilization. Um, and, of course, this is one for all the people that feel that the Sphinx might be a lot older because there is definitely context here now, even though obviously we're dealing with a different country a few thousand miles away. Now, it's considered that of the five or so um, circles that have been found so far, there may be at least another 15 to, to be uncovered just within this area. Um, and quite clearly, for Klaus Schmidt, this is going to take the rest of his life. I mean, he actually lives part of his time in, in the local city of San Liurfa. But what's more incredible is that, that Gebekli Tepe is not the only such site. There's another site just down the road, uh, relatively, uh, very close to the ancient city of Haran, uh, which I visited in 2004, which is currently... Uh, has not had any excavations at all, or hardly any. They've, they've cleared away a few stones. And this may be even bigger than Gobekli Tepe. And when I was there, there are uh, stone rows uh, orientated towards the north. You can see all of these T-shaped pillars, slightly cruder, I must add, which probably suggests they're slightly later, not earlier, um, plus another one of these rectangular skylight windows, which I showed you earlier. Uh, it's just there, laying on, on the floor, um, and if you saw that anywhere else, if you dug it up in a field in, say, Britain, you'd think it was probably no older than medieval times, maybe a 1,000 years at the most. But that has been lying probably on the surface for anything up to 12,000 years, which is quite extraordinary. Um, at Car uh, that particular site, Karahan Tepe, one of the stones that we didn't see because it had already been taken away 
to Haran uh, um, University was this stone here, which has got this incredible serpent uh, alongside, almost like a sperm, a human sperm, um, which reminded me of a head that was found at another one of these, what they call pre-pottery Neolithic sites, um, uh, a place called Navali Kori, just up the road, um, of this head, the front of it's missing, but the back has a ponytail, which is shaped not only like a, uh, a serpent with this head here, but quite clearly a mushroom head. And, um, you know, possibly even phallic. It had multiple symbolism involved. And that has been dated to around 8,000 to 8,400 BC, slightly later than Gebekli Tepe, or most of the activity there, but still part of the same culture. By the way, there are differences in dates um, that you'll read on the net relating to this. And the reason for this is that there's, there are differences between what the carbon-14 dates are coming out with, which are suggesting closer to 10,000 BC, and that to do with stratigraphy, which is what is expected at certain dates. And there are a lot of arguments between the archaeologists um, working in this field, um, in Turkey and Syria and whatever, as to what exact time frame we're dealing with. But in all honesty, we're talking about a time frame that could be either way 500 years. So just bear that in mind when you see any specific dates with anything that I show. Um, here, again, you can see the detail here. You can see these, these serpent heads curling around the side of a stone. There's a spider there. More serpents, you know, sidewindering their way down here. Uh, another arachnid there. Uh, this is uh, the same stone. Um, but, you know, there are multiple symbolism involved. I mean, I think that these also look very much like uh, mushroom heads. So... Um, and you get specific symbols as well. Carved on the side of one stone, you have this um, ring with this crescent, presumably representing the moon, although maybe the, ball, the, the horns of a bull. Um, and above it is this weird H shape. No idea what the H shape would, would relate to 12,000 years ago. But of course, obviously, this is very reminiscent of the, the Sumerian star and crescent that ended up filtering through uh, the, the different areas of the Near East and eventually into um, Africa with the Carthaginians and whatever, and was obviously a symbol of the goddess in, in, in her different forms. But, of course, we have no idea what it might have represented during this time frame. OK, um, now, we have when these were built, where there's no doubt about it, but who built these and why? And the clue is the time frame involved. By the way, this figure on the left um, was that is a, a life-sized human male figure that was found within the city of San Liurfa when they were building, and they came across it. And um, this dates all to, to, to um, 12,000 years, 10,000 BC as well. Um, and that's one of the only images that, that actually remain of what these people might have looked like or how somebody thought they might have looked like, at least anyway. Because we know that around 10,900 BC, and again, these dates, bear in mind, they could sway 500 years or more one way or the other, there was a comet strike in North America. It's something that I've written about extensively in my book, Gateway to Atlantis, um, how there were hundreds of thousands of elliptical craters known as Carolina Bays in states from New York all the way down to Florida, um, they vary in size from um, a few metres up to, you know, kilometres across. Um, and I argued, um, and today uh, this gentleman here, Dr Richard Firestone uh, of um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, all through the book Cycles of Cosmic Catastrophes, 2006, says that these are the remnants of a comet impact, but not so much comet impact but a fragmenting comet that actually fell apart, probably fell into literally hundreds of thousands of parts as it was entering the atmosphere and rained down catastrophe in North America, creating mass firestorms. We know all about this from the, from the catastrophe myths, not only from North America, but from around the world. Um, and he estimates that up to 75% of the human population of North America, which at that time was the so-called Clovis culture, uh, remembered for their very um, 
um, uh, unique style of, of point, the so-called Clovis point that you can see here on the left, were devastated by this, this comet impact. Plus, um, the firestorms and everything else that happened, everything that rained down from the sky, um, destroyed the megafauna um, of the period, not necessarily uh, to the point of extinction, because there's a lot of uh, debate over what uh, may have eventually caused that, but certainly mammoths, mastodons, great sloths, giant camels, saber-toothed tigers, all suffered at this time and probably never recovered and did die out probably shortly afterwards because of this. Um, and not only in North America, but all the way around the world, including Europe, including Russia, including Australia, including Egypt, which we'll come on to later, there is a layer at exactly around um, 10,900 BC of ash and of, of, of material which suggests that there was a comet impact. And what this also shows is that this affected not just North America, but other parts of this comet almost certainly fell in other parts of the world, or that all the ash and the soot and everything that went up into the sky fell down and covered vast parts of the Earth. And what this would have done would have caused devastation all around the globe. This would have, have, have created absolute catastrophe for everything, for humans, to plant life, to animal life, to everything. And we'll mention this a little later again. What this comet impact also did, and again, I, I say this in Gateway to Atlantis, and Richard Firestone also goes into this in detail, that it would have caused the re-advance of the ice sheets, um, which are, are now put to around 12,900 for an event known as the Younger Dryas event. Now, this was basically the fact that the Ice Age had been receding and then suddenly it came back for a short period of time, maybe a couple of hundred years, maybe a thousand years. But what they know is that it came back almost overnight, probably within a, a few weeks, if not a few days. And that's now considered possibly being caused by this comet impact. OK, so how does this affect what we're talking about to do with Gobekli Tepe? Well, the Younger Dryas uh, event, as I've just described, is supposed to have changed the cli climate and led to settled communities and the rise of agriculture in the Near East and the Fertile Crescent. Now, this is generally considered to have occurred around 9000 BC, but as this map here shows, it began in a very small section of the world. Um, and this was the beginning of agriculture, the beginning of farming, the beginning of a sedentary or settled lifestyle. And that was precisely in the area of Gobekli Tepe. Um, and we know this because we all eat wheat today. I try not to, but uh, you, you do, I'm afraid. Well, 68 strains of modern wheat, the DNA has been traced back to the domestication of wild grasses, uh, particularly emma and einkorn, to a particular um, species and source at a place called Karakar uh, Dug. And don't, I'm not pronouncing this exactly right. It was pronounced properly to me uh, at the time. Um, so in other words, all the wheat that we eat, all the bread that we eat, generally comes from 68 different varieties and they can all be traced back to one spot, which is this particular mountain range here. And that's only, um, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's about 15 to 20 miles away from Gobekli Tepe. In other words, Gobekli Tepe was exactly the area where agriculture began. Why? Well, what's interesting, and I'll talk about this again later, is that when I was there, and when I passed this mountain, it's a volcano, it's, a, it's a, an inactive volcano, but I was told a very old Bedouin tale about it, and it was said that the first tillers of the land um, disturbed this hole, um, which was the lair of this seven-headed dragon, and this seven-headed dragon rose up into the sky, and it was so angry that it shot down flames of fire that destroyed all the forests which used to exist thereabouts. Um, and then God got hold of this dragon and dragged it into the seventh heaven 
um, and destroyed it. And as it exploded, literally millions of pieces of rock fell, and those can still be seen in the area around um, this, this, volcanic, volca uh, this extinct volcano today. Now, although this is obviously explaining some kind of volcanic activity, I believe that this also is a recall of this comet impact. We'll come back to that. Now, why was Gebekli Tepe so close to the big beginning points of agriculture? Well, only within the past couple of years, they've uncovered at Gebekli Tepe these huge vats. And these vats are now being speculated to have been used to create beer. Hurrah! <laughs> Up to 12,000 years ago, local grasses were being domesticated, not for food initially, but for beer to feed people so that they could you know, have a drink that wasn't contaminated or whatever else, or simply because they wanted to get off their faces. And that it's believed that the food, i.e., you know, um, that the wheat used for bread or whatever, was a secondary thing. So beer came first and then wheat. And so, in other words, one of the reasons why agriculture began in this reason was to grow beer. But this wasn't just the only first to occur in this area of the globe. As you can see here, the earliest metal use, the earliest met metallurgy, the earliest rectal rectilinear structures, the earliest cult buildings, the oldest uh, domestication of grasses, as I said, earliest wine, um, the earliest hard stone um, lapidary, you know, sort of um, the boring of beads um, in really hard stone, the earliest eye beautification, use of cobalt, the earliest goat herding, animal husbandry with pigs, cattle, sheep, um, and ceramics, the earliest fire, pottery, and statues. Now, I'm not saying there was nothing else in any other parts of the world before this, but this seems to be where it began for us in the Western world. Um, and this led Mehdi Azidi, uh, the professor of Near Eastern Studies at the University of New York, to suggest that the inhabitants of this land, Upper Mesopotamia as they call it, went through an unexplained stage of accelerated technological evolution prompted by yet uncertain forces. They pulled ahead of their surrounding communities, the majority of which were also among the most advanced technical societies of the world, to embark on a transformation from a low-density hunter-gathering economy to a high-density food-producing economy. Why was that? Well, one clue is the fact that in 2007, Klaus Schmidt said that of Gebekli Tepe, and he's going to regret this probably for the rest of his life, this is the Garden of Eden. He also said of those who erected the stones that they were the watchmen of the period. Now, so when somebody pointed that out to me, I thought, yes, because this goes on to what I'd been talking about for a long time. Okay, the Garden of Eden, we all know from the story of Adam and Eve. Um, it wasn't just featured in that story in Genesis. It features elsewhere in the, in the Bible, the Old Testament, obviously, as a kingdom. There is a place called Eden. It's mentioned in the same breath as, as Assyria and Babylon and whatever, Eden. So it existed and it's known to have existed in the region of the Near East. Where was it? Well, it was said that where Eden was, the four rivers of paradise rose. And those four rivers um, were, well, I won't go into the, the original details of them, but essentially they all rise in exactly the same area. And that was around somewhere called Lake Van, a huge inland sea um, which borders eastern Turkey into Armenia. And this is where I fixed the, the Garden of Eden uh, at this time. And bearing in mind that Gebekli Tepe was not known about until 2000. And I wrote in a book called From the Ashes of Angels in 1996, this is where the foundation point of civilization would be found. And what's interesting is that I certainly wasn't the first person to, to say this. In the 17th century, Athanasius Kircher, um, who was a, a monk, um, wrote extensively about the Garden of Eden. And he, he did this map here, um, which actually pinpointed the exact point with these four rivers. Um, 
um, all coming out from the same spot in the same area um, of East Turkey and, uh, and Armenia. In fact, this area was Armenia at that time. Here's another map by somebody called Emmanuel Bowen, uh, done uh, sometime um, as late as, uh, as the, the, the late 18th century, which shows Armenia, but um, it's also marked as Eden and Paradise. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they were on the now. They got exactly the right place during this early time. There we go. There's, there's a close-up of that same map. Eden, Paradise, Armenia. There's Lake Van there. And the, 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 the sources of the four main rivers are there. Obviously, the two obvious ones being the, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Okay, now, why is all this important to Gebekli Tepe? Well, it's in that area, exactly that area, that I would constitute as a Eden anyway. But what's important is that Eden wasn't just the place of, um, of Adam and Eve, because it was also the focus of an of a ancient text, probably the earliest forms go back to 200 BC, uh, from the Dead Sea, known as the Book of Enoch, uh, and other similar, what they call Enochian material. And they talk about what happened when the giants lived in the earth. Now, those giants, they refer to under the names of the Watchers uh, and their offspring, the Nephilim. Um, and it was said that the Watchers were these angels who lived in this mountain like environment, almost like a, an Israeli kibbutz style um, situation. Um, and they were removed from, from what we call human society or mortal society. But at some point, they decided to come down and mingle with us mortals. They took mortal wives and they revealed to them the arts and sciences of heaven. And all of those arts and sciences of heaven are exactly the firsts that took place in the same area of the globe, the Near East, Eden, the so-called cradle of civilization. Exactly the same things. Um, and yet, obviously, whoever wrote the Book of Enoch in 200 BC, probably based on texts that were thousands of years older by that time, um, would not have had this information and I'll come on to this gentleman on the, on the right in a moment. Because it was said in the Book of Enoch that the Watchers were extremely tall, um, with white but ruddy skin, piercing eyes, long white hair, um, and who wore cloaks of feathers. Uh, so in other words, they had very albino traits. Um, and that they were described also as like having... The, their faces like vipers, visage like a viper is, is how it's described at one point in translation. They were, they're also referred to as serpents and as the serpents of Eden or the serpent of Eden. One of them specifically was said to be the serpent of Eden. And I take this to be long faces, long, slim faces, serpent-like faces. Um, and... Um, is this then what the builders of Gebekli looked like in this region? And were they that these watchers, these walking serpents, these birdmen, as they're described, in cloaks of feathers? Some of them, you know, seem to be tall albinos. Did they control the development of the local Neolithic revolution? Well, this is exactly what I said in From the Ashes of Angels, 1996. Of course, obviously, I didn't know about Gebekli Tepe at that time. I also pointed out that statues from a slightly later date, 5000 BC, from the Ubaid culture that show serpent or lizard-like features, um, maybe some abstract representation of these watchers who lived, you know, a few thousand years beforehand, and their memory was being passed down and represented by these Ubaid statues. By the way, David Icke got hold of this story and used it in his, which is why you get all the lizard people stuff, because the whole thing came together from that. It's, it's a fact, he told me. Um, anyway, what I also said was, were these watchers, these founders of civilization, remembers of the gods of Sumar, the so-called Anunnaki, um, which the so-called Karsag tablets, um, which are these texts from a certain uh, temple place called uh, Karsag, um, say lived in a kibbutz-style communities uh, called Eden, spelt slightly differently, but meaning steps uh, of a mountain, um, in a mountainous-like region, as say, re variously referred to as, as Karsag, Dilman, other names as well. Um, and also, are they also the immortals of the Iranian myth as well? 
Well, this is what I wrote back then. But now Klaus Schmidt, this is what he says of those that constructed Gebekli Tepe. He has engaged in some speculation regarding the belief systems of the groups that created Gebekli Tepe. This corresponds well with the ancient Sumerian belief that agriculture, animal husbandry and weaving had been brought to mankind from the sacred mountain Duku, same, same thing as what I was talking about, which was inhabited by Anuki deities, um, very ancient gods without individual names. Klaus Schmidt identifies this story as an oriental primeval myth that preserves a partial memory of the Neolithic. That's exactly what I believe, exactly. Okay, so where did these watchers, Anunnaki, this shamanically actually come from? Um, people have speculated they came from the north, Russia, the Russian steppes, possibly as far away as Finland. They were the frost giants. Um, some have su uh, pre suggested they come from Southeast Asia, like Stephen Oppenheimer. Um, but my favourite uh, theory is that they came from Egypt. Um, and that they came from the area of the Nile and travelled uh, to the Euphrates and the Tigris um, to the Garden Eden to Gebekli Tepe. Why do I believe this? Because of this comet impact that we talked about earlier, there are myths in Egypt of a similar event. For instance, the Copt talked about um, how this, this king called Surid, who uh, predicted fire coming from, the, from Leo, the lion, in the sky, um, and how he built the pyramids to hold the records of his race um, so that they would be preserved afterwards. There was fire and then there was a flood. Also, there is the story of Hathor in her guise as Sekhmet, um, who did the bidding of the sun god Ra and nearly destroyed humankind by raining down uh, fire from the sky uh, and nearly destroying mankind. Uh, this and uh, other stories, including one about an enemy snake called the Great Leaping One in the building texts of, of Edfu that nearly destroyed the world and brought darkness, I think are all memories from an Egyptian or Nile perspective of this comet event um, during the, the 11th millennium BC. What we also know is that on the Nile in the Sudan and in Upper Egypt, from around 15,000 to 11,000 BC, i.e. just before things kick off at Gebekli Tepe, there were extremely advanced communities. The so-called Isnan and Quadan um, were experimenting with agriculture, proto-agriculture. There's good evidence for this. Did they bring those skills from the Nile and take them to the Euphrates, to the area around Gebekli Tepe? Did they, you know, use this expertise the, the shamanic elite, did they, they come into a new area and just take over the developing peoples? I think it's very possible. What we also know is that, forget what was happening um, in the Garden of Eden, if you like, uh, in the sub-Saharan area of, um, of Mali, in the area that's now occupied by the Dogon, who I, I do strongly believe have connections with Egypt, the oldest pottery in Africa... Uh, has recently been discovered, and this dates to 9,500 BC. Um, it's in the Bandagari Plateau, exactly the, the, the places that you see in connection with the Dogon, has been occupied right the way since 9,500 BC, and, and indeed all the way back to at least 50,000 BC. Advanced communities were in this area. Now, I find this really interesting, and I find this is more evidence that whoever created Gebekli Tepe came out of Africa. Now, what would a comet impact have on Egypt and Africa in general? Floods, cessation of animal migration, starvation, territorial invasions, open combat, religious changes, ethnological movements, people moving about all over the place. It's very likely that they would have moved a long way away, probably got right out of the area that they saw as the place of the catastrophe and moved into new regions just afterwards. And I think one of those regions was the Euphrates and the Tigris, the area of Gebekli Tepe. And that whoever created that, we'll call them the watchers, the builders of Gebekli Tepe, um, the gods, the Anunnaki or whatever, that they were the people that came into the area of the Near East, Eden, Upper Mesopotamia, Kurdistan, whatever you want to call it. And they founded, basically, civilization as we know it today. So what 
is Gobekli Tepe. Lots of people have speculated already on what it is. I have done in my own books, in the Cygnus Mystery, I talk about it being aligned to the constellation of Cygnus, um, but in another book, Gods of Eden, I talk about other similar, uh, you know, what they call pre-pottery neo pre Neolithic sites being aligned to other stars. It could be just some work creation scheme, as somebody suggested. Um, others have said, oh, it was just a place uh, uh, for the clans to meet, each of the different animals representing a different clan. And there are all sorts of other little theories and, uh, and ideas, and all of them may have their merit, but this is what I think. Firstly, Smith himself refers to Gebekli Tepe as a Stone Age zoo. There are so many different types of creatures, animals, and birds for you to even start to interpret the symbolism would be virtually impossible. Because where do you start? Oh, they're bulls, but they're also snakes, but they're also birds, but there's also spiders, but there's also lizards, but there's also dogs, there's also aura, you know. Where, where would you start to interpret all of this? So I think that any theories have got to encompass all of what's going on. Um, and I think that there is a clue in this function here, because in my opinion, I think that Gepekli Tepe is an inventory, a record an ark in stone. And remember, the whole story of the ark um, of Noah also is in this very same area of the globe. Um, it was to preserve everything we see, experience, and understand. A celebration of the powers of nature, of life and of death, whether, they, whether it be of darkness or of light. You know, you've got uh, scorpions, for instance, and, and spiders that would bite you and possibly kill you. You've got animals that you need to live on. You've got animals that, that, that are symbols of, of, of what we call royalty or kingship, lions and things like that. It's everything that they experience within nature. But it also seems to be a memorial to a paradise, a declining golden age. There is no hint of disaster in the stone carvings themselves, just abundance, life and energy Yet a sense of imminent change, impending catastrophe, as it had been before. Maybe, just maybe, Gebekli Tepe was constructed to, so that if anything that had happened, like it happened before, you know, there's big catastrophes, lots of people got killed, animals, that, that if it ever happens again, we've got a record of it, that, you know, this we can keep as a memory, almost like a time capsule, if you like. That's one possibility. But I think it's no coincidence that, that the 68 different varieties of wheat all have their source just a few miles away from Gebekli Tepe, the, it, which is the start point of agriculture, this, this, this car car dog. Um, and that I think that there is a clue here in the fact of this legend associated with this very same mountain, because it talks about the first people to till the land. Well, the first people to till the land would have been those that were around Gebekli Tepe, you know, domesticating these grasses, einkorn and emma, to create what we now know as wheat. They would have been the first people to till the land. But because they did this, this is the legend, they released a dragon a seven-headed dragon, as I said earlier, that ends up destroying the world, destroying all the forests that were around there, uh, and God has to raise it up into the, the seventh heaven and destroy it up there so it can't do any more damage. This, to me, is a memory of that comet event. Now, whether it, this is the first comet, the, the, the one from 10,900 BC, or one maybe slightly later, maybe fragments that are late to date, I'm not sure. The dating is very, very difficult, as I've tried to explain here. Um, you know, we could be talking 500 years either way. We could even be talking about 1,000 years either way. But we're talking about the same events, I think, here. And by the way, what I didn't explain is that this strange plate, which I probably showed earlier and never mentioned, um, is actually the image of this seven-headed creature. It's actually known, and it's, it's more widely known in Turkey, Turkey as the Shah Marah. Um, 
And you can see it's got these seven heads here, which are underneath, plus this one here. And this dragon, by the way, I'm pretty certain is exactly the same as the Sumerian deity known as Tiamat, who also um, was said to have, have, have been split apart um, to form the, 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 the physical world as we know it today. This was like the Turkish form of Tiamat. But I think it represents this comet or aspects of the story of this catastrophe, which we've talked about, that happened during this very same time frame. But the thing is, is that if some further catastrophe took place when Gepekli Tepe was already up and running, then I think that it would have caused chaos because you've got these wisdom bringer guys coming in, I think, from the Nile, from what we know as Egypt, and they're saying, you know, look, we can live a different lifestyle. You know, we can create these great monuments with your help and we can, you know, I can, we can give you this great wisdom. So they do this, they till the land, and then suddenly they get this catastrophe. What happens? I think they start to blame this elite for what had just taken place. And I think that what happened is that the watchers, these builders of Gebekli Tepe, changed their tactics at this point. And I think they probably changed from being wisdom bringers to rulers by fear to hold together the communities. Um, and I won't go into why I believe that, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that this wasn't, you know, some kind of sweetness and light society. And I think that this is preserved in the Book of Enoch as the story of the fall of watchers um, and how, you know, they, they lived in heaven to start with, i.e., you know, within these communities and then started mingling with the mortal kind, taking mortal wise, revealing all of the arts and sciences of heaven, um, and that this was a story preserved all the way down through to the Dead Sea communities that, that wrote the, the first versions of, of the, the Book of Enoch. So these guys, these watchers, if they did come out of Egypt, what more do we know about them when they were in, still in Egypt? Well, various ancient texts uh, still preserved uh, in Egypt talk about some kind of primeval structure, the first building, the first temple, the first enclosure being built on a Nile island, which was um, seen as an island of creation, um, located somewhere to the north of the ancient city of Memphis. Well, just north of there is what was known as Rostau. Rostau was the ancient name of Giza. The name Rostau means the mouth of of the passages, um, uh, an inference to the entrance into some kind of cave underworld, which featured very strongly in ancient Egyptian myth from the very earliest times. And it was said that from this structure down through the island, there was access to an underground cave complex. Um, and this was known as the Duat Embar, the underworld of the soul, um, and it was said that this structure and the island itself was destroyed. It was rebuilt, but destroyed to start with by the appearance, and I mentioned it earlier, this enemy snake called the Great Leaping One that brought darkness over the lands, that made the waters rise up, that killed all the first divine inhabitants of this island. Uh, and then afterwards, when the waters had receded, more divine inhabitants came to this area and they worshipped and venerated these earlier inhabitants now as ghosts, inferring that they were now dead and were now spirits. And this was the memory of the first gods of Egypt. Now, I think that the enemy snake, as I mentioned earlier, is a memory of the comet and its effect upon Egypt and the Nile. And remember that that layer of charcoal and other debris from the comet has been found around the world, including Egypt, so we know that that comet definitely had an impact in Egypt. And I think that these ancient texts are referring to this catastrophe. Now, as I said, there may be more bits of it. It may have come in parts, but we're talking about a general catastrophe that ended one age, what you might call the Golden Age, and began the age which we now all live in sometime around 
11, 12,000, maybe even 13,000 years ago. It's the same event or same sequence of events. Now, ever since 1985, I've been involved with a adventure quest, if you like, to uncover a cave underworld um, around the area of Giza. Most people will know this under the name the Hall of Records, but uh, we're talking about the existence of some kind of cave underworld that would reflect that which is contained within the ancient texts. And in 2008, um, I entered into a tomb um, in the very extreme northern part of the plateau. Here's the three pyramids here. This is a geological map, which we came to name the Tomb of the Birds, um, simply because uh, this tomb, which is nothing is written about whatsoever. What is written about it, I could put on a postage stamp um, and is never visited by tourists and is never investigated um, by modern day uh, Egyptologists. But I'd realised there was something important about this place. And having discovered some 200 year old memoirs of a British diplomat and explorer by the name of Henry Salt that talked about entering catacombs at Giza up to several hundred yards distance uh, and coming across other chambers, hewn chambers, and I'm sorry, not hewn chambers, just chambers, I must be careful with that word. Um, we realised, myself uh, and a colleague by the name of uh, Nigel Skinner Simpson, an Egyptological researcher, that this tomb somewhere held the clue. Uh, and this is here, this is what it looks like. It's a very large tomb. Um, its actual uh, name is NC2. Uh, that was given to it by uh, an American uh, Egyptologist in 1939 by the name of George Reisner. But all he did was draw a rough plan, nothing else, or his people did at least. And we went there in March 2008 and uncovered a previously unknown entrance into a cave world that nobody, as far as we're aware, had ever seen in modern times. And we got into this and there was this huge opening chamber which had been partly hewn. So in other words, that definitely had been used by whoever it was that constructed the tomb, which we now think probably dates to Old Kingdom time. So it's probably about 4,000, 4,500 years old. And this huge chamber led into a series of corridors and other chambers and compartments um, that myself uh, and my wife and to uh, a degree Nigel uh, as well began to explore. Uh, and we got into this cave system four times in 2008, in March and April of that year, and took these incredible pictures. And I've written about this in my book, uh, Beneath the Pyramids, um, but just a point here with this picture here. See all this redness here? That's what's known as red ochre. And um, we'll come on to the significance of that uh, shortly. But we scrambled through. Uh, this is an extremely dangerous place, extremely. And I'll show you why in a minute. Um, because not only is, are you walking in pitch darkness, remember these images are, the, are flash photography. You can't see a hand in front of your face, obviously, and even torches cannot really determine exactly what's going on until it's virtually too light. Um, so in other words, most of the knowledge that we have of what we, we, we uncovered is from the photographs that, that we ourselves took. Um, there's my wife Sue there in a deep part. It's the, the first part of the, the cave complex, and by the way, you, you'll see how this is relevant to everything else shortly. Um, there are huge blocks that have been um, uh, that have fallen here probably uh, during um, earthquakes over you know many many thousands of years that you have to navigate to get anywhere within it and um, eventually we only traveled ourselves for a distance of probably around um, 100 yards I'm, I'm saying that as a conservative estimate others suggest uh, including my wife that we got an awful lot further uh, but certainly as I try to take it you know pace by pace that's what I would conservatively say that we're able to get but we know that this goes on for several hundred yards um, and I'll show you more of that in a minute there are bats down there's colonies of bats um, which are flying past your head all the time they come in waves uh, one hit me right in the face at one point um, there are also spiders down there 
um, we identified uh, a white widow, which is the, the white form of the black widow, which obviously can kill. Um, and the only other person to have got in the caves is a guy by the name of Richard Gabriel. We got in there with his partner in November 2009, that last year, before they were actually sealed completely uh, earlier on this year. So nobody can get in them now at all. And there are actually camel spiders all in the roof as well. You can see them here. And they're horrible bastards. Um, you do not want to be encountering them. Uh, and thank God when Sue and I were in there, we didn't know they were there. Uh, but even then, we realised we had to cover up. And um, so on the final uh, visits that we got there, um, you can see that we have the scarves. I've still got my hat on. But um, um, masks the lot, basically, um, to, to cover up ourselves just in case of, of any spiders and whatever. Um, now, the caves are natural. Um, they were probably formed most likely in the last 200,000 years. Um, the geology on them I've just put up online on andrewcollins.com. I won't go into that, but everything about them says that they're natural. Uh, some might argue, oh, no, well, you know, maybe they look like catacombs that, that, are, 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 built, that are constructed by the dynastic Egyptians. They're not. Uh, there is plenty here that suggests that, that they are natural. Um, they are incredible in size. Here, here's Sue, who's nearly six foot anyway. Um, you can see how tall the ceilings are just at, at this point here. The caves are prehistoric in origin, origin but they were used in dynastic times, um, certainly in parts of them, for bird na as an animal ne ne necropolis. Um, almost certainly there's prehistoric archaeology expected to be found here. Um, and... This is the map that I drew and is in the book here of exactly where we went. And right at the end here, there was a small tube where it goes right the way down. And neither ourselves or Richard Gabriel uh, and his partner went further than that because we were aware of the dangers and it just was not right to go through at that time without preparations. It sank down to a small tube and even when we got back and examined the pictures you could see all these bugs inside it it just did not look like a place that you want to go unless you were well prepared basically um i know that might sound like a cop out but i want to live um now i showed you the the, the plan of them but what we've found since coming back is that the caves may well have been recorded on radar a radar satellite image that was produced by the terrasar x uh, radar satellite um, company in July 2007. Um, it shows a, um, a shadow area, and bear in mind these, they, this company promotes its maps to be able to see underground, so that you can see underground structures, that you can see almost certainly the caves there. There is nothing on the corresponding Google map that was taken within a couple of days, coincidentally, of this. Bear in mind this is done at night without any light at all, uh, any visible light, um, seems to show this shadow line. Well, that shadow line continues on, turns and goes all the way down to beneath the second pyramid. And I think that this is where Henry Salt and his Italian um, colleague Giovanni Caviglia reached in 1817, directly beneath the the, um, the second pyramid. And what's interesting is that the second pyramid itself is seen to be the tomb of Hermes. Um, and he was the guy, guard of soul, the, the, the guide of souls, basically. And he was also seen to be the son of Agathodemon, the good spirit, a serpent whose tomb was the great pyramid, not the second pyramid, because that was in Hermes, beneath which this serpent reposed. His images of Agatha Demon here from, from Gnostic Gems. Now, the tomb guardian that, that we spoke to, um, who, who was um, keeper of that particular tomb, spoke no English, but he referred to them, uh, the, the, the cave, which he refused to go into because he said that they were the haunt of El Hanash. I said, well, what's El Hanash? And El Hanash is a giant snake. And he said he'd never been in there and never would go into it. By the way, that, that's a creation. That, that's not what we came across, I promise you. Um, that's what I just felt inclined to do after weird dreams coming back from being inside these caves. I just felt I had to do this. Um, and this is really interesting because 
we didn't see this, but Richard Gabriel, when he went in there in November 2009, managed to catch this incredible simulacra in the deepest chamber that we reached, which is over the doorway of this great snake. You can see it here. See the eyes, you see the, the nostrils, the mouth, and the, the, the head here, like, very much like this snake head here. And I believe that it was snake simulacra like this that may well have created this idea of this cave underworld being the domain of a snake, which conforms perfectly with ancient Egyptian tradition to do with the fact that caves were connected with snakes and the earth god Geb and also the goddess Hathor, which I'll come on to shortly. And the importance of simulacra, particularly uh, snake simulacra, is seen here in Africa elsewhere. Um, in the Kalahari Desert, um, the San Bushman, their sacred site, known as the Mountains of the Gods, the Rock that Whispers, venerated this python stone for over 70,000 years. The San Creation myth, humans were descended from a python. So that shows the importance of venerating these, this rock simulacra in the form of snakes. It's present at a place called Jebel Barkel, um, just in Sudan, just, just, just south of, of Egypt. Um, there is a, a pillar of rock shaped like a, um, a, a, a cobra or a snake about to strike here. You can see it here. Um, and it's represented in a shrine inside um, the Temple of Amun there. Here's the, the, the actual rock and there's the, the cobra there. That's Jebel Barkel itself. Um, and inside Jebel Barkel itself is a cave grotto uh, that was part of a temple of Hathor. And she becomes very important to our story now. The goddess Hathor, she was the, the, the mother of... Um, Horus, the god Horus, um, that's got Horus the Elder, that is. Um, she was also associated with a snake, and in her temple at uh, Dendara, there is a snake in the crypt that's venerated even by Muslim women to this day to, the, the, to, to give birth. Now, Hathor, the oldest representations of her are of this, this bull's head. She's a prehistoric um, goddess and was also represented in this so called dancing goddesses. Um, but this dancing goddess you can see is covered in red ochre. Red ochre was sacred to Hathor. Um, and red ochre is something that's been put on by, by, by women in particular, priestess, shamanesses in Africa. Here's a Himba woman uh, from Namibia, um, completely covered in, in, in red ochre. You can see this red ochre here. Remember, that's what we found inside the caves. Um, red ochre has been venerated uh, in Africa, certainly since about, you know, 78,000. This is from the Blombos Cave in, um, in South Africa. Uh, red ochre was, was put upon the graves of, of the ancients right from Paleolithic times. Here's these twins from the Danube in Australia. Um, Hathor was basically the, the, the patron goddess of Giza. She was known as the mistress of the sycamore. There was sycamore grove at Giza. Um, and in this role, um, as mistress of the sycamore, she fed the the, the, the deceased with water and from the fruit of the tree. She was also said to haunt the sycamore grove where there is a well um, actually at Giza. And this well is said to be one of the other entrances into the underworld there. Um, I see the caves were, were, were the womb and birth canal of some kind of cosmic mother seen later as Hathor in, in Egyptian dynastic times associated with a cow and a snake. The redness of, of, of their interior walls, the red ochre, seen as the lifeblood itself. And after coming out of the caves, I found that there was a weird prophecy to do with El Hanash, this great snake, and the caves beneath Giza. Not specifically the ones we found, but just those when they would be found and entered. Because it was said that El Hanash guards this huge diamond beneath the ground at Giza. Um, and it said that whoever finds this um, will basically um, know that the wisdom of the ancients, this will happen in the end days, and it will only be the special chosen person that actually finds it. So what is this diamond? Well, I think the diamond symbolises the seed or egg in the womb of the cosmic mother. Um, it's most likely a conical stone or crystal, known variously as an omphalos, a betel, or a lingam, obviously, as you probably know from Hindu tradition, signifying the birth or generation of the world, guarded over by a snake, remembered in 
Arab Egyptian legend today as El Hanash. And with that, I think that's about it. So andrewcollins.com for much more of this material beneath the pyramids. I think there's probably one copy left around. And follow this whole debate on Facebook now. Go on to andrewcollins.com, press through to the news page. You'll see my ugly mug there and just press that and um, become a friend on Facebook. So thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>